name is Becky Panetta, and I'm the Agriculture Conservation Planner for Marion Soil and Water Conservation District. Thank you for joining us today for our May 2023 uh, First Friday. Our present presenter today on the Emerald Ash Borer is Christine Buell. She's a graduate, graduate of Oregon State University and the University of Wisconsin-Madison. She has served as an entomologist from Hawaii to the country of Lebanon, on projects spanning from public health to chemical ecology. She currently serves as the state forest entomologist with the Oregon Department of Forestry, where she provides statewide technical assistance to public and private landowners and monitors forest health via aerial and ground surveys. So Christine, thank you for joining us today. I'm gonna to stop sharing my screen and you are welcome to go ahead and get started. Um, the way that I'd like to run this presentation is I like to present everything first because I might answer questions that you have as we go, but please do feel free to, as we go, put your questions in the chat just so you don't forget them. And then at the end, I will cover everything in the chat and then all, any verbal questions that come in. Um, and I'm going to try to be brief, but I am starting from the base level of knowledge so that everybody is on the same page and has the same information. Um, but you might be hearing some things that you've already heard, and then there might be some details that you want a little bit more info on. And so I can provide that at the end. Some details we don't have the answers to just yet, and I'll be very uh, direct about what those are that we're still trying to figure out. Um, as mentioned, I am an entomologist with Oregon Department of Forestry. I'm within a forest health unit that also consists of a pathologist and our invasive species specialist, Wyatt Williams, who's actually the head of the Emerald Ash Borer Project. Um, he and I kind of split insects, um, so anything that has not entered the state yet is typically in his domain, and once it becomes established here, then it kind of comes into my domain. And so he's spearheading emerald ash for, and then I'm picking up loose ends and then um, providing my entomological expertise. Um, we also have an aerial survey specialist because we do conduct extensive aerial and um, ground surveys as well. That includes um, visual observations, trapping, et cetera. Um, and so we're all kind of pulling together as a team. There are four of us on that team. Um, so that's not very many people to cover the state, but we are always there basically as extension agents to answer questions, help diagnose, provide management or what have you, or direct you to a different source. So this project that I'm gonna talk about um, in dealing with this new arrival of Emerald Ash Board is a multi-agency effort. And so our agencies were planning ahead predicting that this would come to us at some point and really pulled together very quickly and are working very well together um, uh, to tackle this issue. And it is going to be a long-term, very expensive, possibly forever issue that we have on our landscape. So it's really good that we started working together quickly. Okay, so as I mentioned, this is a new arrival. So this is the first time it's ever been detected further west than Colorado. And it was detected last June, very end of June, um, at a schoolyard in Forest Grove, Oregon. That's in Washington County, um, very close to the Washington state border. So we're working with them extensively. So I say that it was first detected at that point. But by the level of damage, we assume that the insect has been at that site at least for about three plus years because the level of damage was quite extensive, more than could have been done in just one season. And oftentimes, invasives that arrive to an area go undetected for quite some time. That's very common until they build in numbers where their damage can actually be visible. Um, very often you see the damage first and not the insect. But I am going to give you um, details on how to identify the insect. Um, and the damage that it causes, but be aware there are a lot of other things that um, can look like emerald ash borer damage such as drought. That's basically the, the main one. Um, so as mentioned, this was found in a schoolyard in a parking lot at, um, in non-native eastern species um, planted ash trees. And um, you can see here, this is June, they should be fully leafed out, um, but they were heavily defoliated not by the insect eating the leaves, even though they eat a little bit of the leaves, but just that the trees were so girdled that they dropped those leaves or the buds didn't even form leaves. Um, so the damage that we saw um, was in the tree canopy. We also saw epicormic shoots. I'll show you pictures of that. So shoots coming up from the base of the tree, that tree is struggling to um, try and stay alive by sending out shoots elsewhere. Um, and then we saw a bunch of V-shaped exit holes and adult beetles flying around in the canopy and peeling back the bark. I saw very extensive larval damage. 
Um, and I'll go through the cycles of where they are when, um, but to see adult beetles just flying around in the canopy, um, just in that quantity, that's in a very high level um, amount of damage. And we actually were alerted um, to this detection by a city of Portland, um, Dominic Mays, who you may know, um, employee that was well aware of Emerald Ash Borer and immediately called ODF and we responded um, that same day. Um, so it's really a testament to spreading the information, sharing with people what these signs and symptoms look like, as I'm going to do today, and then knowing who to contact about them. So um, that's just that in action, that it worked very well. This insect is typically identified or first um, detected um, by vi visual observations. We can trap for them as well, but they don't come as readily to traps. Oftentimes it's somebody that's working outside or just happens to be outside that notices something and goes, this doesn't quite look right. And so that's one of the main features that we want you to let us know about. If you're seeing ash trees that really aren't looking good, and then you take a closer look and go, mm, you know what, I see some signs or symptoms here, we want you to report that to us. Um, oh, a little bit of trace back. We don't know where the insect came from. Um, that's really hard to trace back. Um, we looked at the nursery. Those trees originally came from years before. Um, there are a lot of different routes that they can take. And so the way that this insect actually first arrived in North America um, is likely through wood shipments. That's really common um, for wood borers to arrive in different types of wood products or even pallets um, through overseas shipments. And then um, it can travel state to state by nursery stock or firewood. Those are most common. And so it first traveled to the U.S or was first detected in the U.S. in 2002, where it was detected in Detroit, Michigan. Again, it was estimated that it had been there for at least a few years. Um, then there, it spread from state to state, and a quarantine um, was established in the eastern states to try to prevent emerald ash borer from moving um, to western states via that nursery stock or firewood. But in 2013, it actually jumped that quarantine and was detected in Colorado. Now, it's really hard to get any teeth behind these types of quarantines. We can't have people um, that are posted along the quarantine to check every single thing that comes through. Sometimes there's nobody checking. There's just a heavy fine if something is moved um, because we just don't have enough personnel to keep on top of everything. So from uh, 2013 then to 2019, it reached 33 states. Right now it's in 36 states, including Oregon and including Washington, D.C., um, and so this is the first detection west of Colorado. However, that does not mean it's not in other states from Colorado to here. It's just that it has not been detected as of yet. As mentioned, it often arrives from other countries um, in treated, untreated wood imports. It's coming over from Eastern Russia and um, Eastern Asia. And then it travels from state to state via nursery stock and firewood. It can infest um, tree material that is one inch and larger in diameter. So really small stock can be infested as well. We do have many different certifications, inspections that are taking place at our borders and also in inter um, state transmissions of greenhouse materials. However, we just can't catch everything. There's a lot of material moving around. Um, in the counties where emerald ash borer has been identified in eastern states where it has become established, they have experienced over 95% ash mortality. The reason why that number is not 100% ash mortality is because some trees have been preventatively treated. Because once this insect comes in, these trees, they did not co-evolve with this insect, and so they don't have the chemical defenses or what have you to protect themselves or repel the insect. And so they fully succumb to emerald ash borer. So think of this as chestnut blight, Dutch elm disease. It's um, similar to those types of things where it's complete destruction of a species. Over 100 million trees are estimated to have been lost since the 1990s. And I say 1990s because that's when it was assumed that the um, Detroit detection was actually um, established, started getting established in that area. Other states have tried and failed eradication. We have learned so much from these other states that have been very free with their information and guiding um, us and other states along. And so we are not wasting our time and resources on eradication just based on the biology of this insect. It's really hard, if not impossible, to eradicate. Nobody's done it. And so we are focusing our efforts on a slow the spread policy. 
in which we're reducing the population of emerald ash borer and reducing their ability to spread out from areas, thereby buying us more time to come up with some solutions or plant with other species um, to just try and protect areas as much as we can rather than getting hit really hard in an area all at once. Um, this insect is going to be of high economic and ecological cost. Uh, we are bracing for that. We've learned a lot, again, from other states on how to defray some of these costs. Just to give you a, a visual of the kind of devastation, um, that last image I showed was an aerial survey. I'll show that again. All the brown trees are ash. All the other trees are other species. So um, complete destruction of a species. This is just a street that um, within the matter of three years of emerald ash borer being detected there, all of the ash trees were killed. And so if you could see that street today with all those trees removed, um, obviously that's a, a, an aesthetic issue. Um, everybody likes to see greenery and trees, lowers property values. It reduces an ecological niche that's especially important in urban areas. And this is especially damaging for communities that are underserved, that just don't have the finances to easily remove and replace trees. So we're really targeting those communities. We're trying to drum up funding through new legislation um, to try and give them more money to combat this insect. So Portland, one of our cities that actually has the finances um, that can contend with this insect, um, has about 5% of its street trees are comprised of ash. And that's typically uh, green ash, um, non-native organ or non-native ash species instead of organ ash on our street trees. Um, but just that 5% is estimated to cost about $50 million for removal and replacement. So um, for Portland to shoulder that is quite a burden. Imagine smaller communities that don't have those budgets and maybe have an even higher component of ash in their urban areas. As we know, ash is also a huge component of our natural areas, especially along waterways, um, typically found west of the Cascades, but also in some other scattered pockets, especially in areas where there's some ephemeral water. You can find ash in very dry habitats because of its ability to withstand extremely dry soil, but also extremely wet soil. So it's our only native species that can withstand those two competing um, types of um, ecological factors at, at one time. So it, half the year it can be wet, half the year it can be really dry. Ash is the only tree that we have that's native to Oregon that can withstand that. Um, so it's going to be problematic trying to replace those trees in some of those more um, extreme sites. So oftentimes when we see waterways, they're lined almost 100% with ash canopy. Um, Oregon ash is our only native ash tree. In feeding trials, emerald ash borer really loves Oregon ash. It um, thinks it's tasty and it develops very well on it, unfortunately. Um, and this tree is essential in these natural areas for shading, bank stabilization, stabilization, and then habitat for threatened and endangered species. And in a time when we're already concerned with our drought um, and uh, protecting salmonids and other species in our waterways, losing this component that provides such overstory for these areas is really devastating. Um, we have all of these little ash pockets and these islands that are scattered throughout um, our agricultural areas that are 100% ash. So I'll show you a picture of that. Oftentimes driving down Willamette Valley, this is not an uncommon sign to see um, all these agricultural areas and then pockets of trees. And when you go into these um, treed areas, oftentimes they're 100% ash where there is water present. And so not having a replacement there means we lose that um, overstory canopy. Ash is also important to our indigenous peoples. It's utilized for canoe paddles um, and a variety of other things. And so we are working with tribes to see um, how we can protect ash in their areas, but also trying to um, provide them with any ash trees that are infested and we will sanitize them um, so that they can still utilize the wood products um, for those purposes so that we don't just waste all of this material. So real quick and dirty, um, ash is um, pretty distinct to identify. However, we have a lot of non-natives that can kind of be confusing, especially in our urban landscape. But um, generally, um, ash has a compound leaf, so a whole bunch of little leaflets on one leaf stem. Um, we do have a few other trees that have that similarity. However, it also has opposite branching. So rather than alternating those branches, they're opposite. So those two key features are really helpful for identifying ash. 
It has, um, as it gets older, some diamond shaped or lattice bark that becomes pretty distinct once you've seen it over and over again. And then it has a Samara, which is a single winged seed, as, um, as opposed to like a maple seed that's double winged. So a little bit about emerald ash borer itself. It is a wood boring beetle, but it does not go deeply into the wood. Unlike other wood borers that typically just cause defects, it can kill trees because it just goes under the bark and it girdles the tree, meaning it cuts off those vascular tissues that are actively growing, actively translocating moisture and nutrients throughout the tree. So that the ca uh, cambium and the upper layers of the sapwood is what it's actually tunneling through as larvae. So it is native to Eastern Asia and Russia. Um, and the insect will um, fly to a tree once it emerges um, or coming out the same tree. It'll feed a little bit on the, on the foliage, um, just a tiny little bit, and then it mates. They lay eggs on the outside of the tree. Those eggs will hatch, they'll burrow in as larvae, um, and then those larval galleries are serpentine. So they just snake back and forth in an S-like pattern, and those galleries get wider as the larva gets bigger. It then turns into a pupa. It then can move into um, the outer bark when it's pupating. And this is important for um, one detection feature that I'll get to. Um, and then once it pupates, um, spends a little bit of time there, it will turn into adult and chew its way out, leaving a D-shaped exit hole that's about the size of um, a, a pencil eraser if you cut it in half. Um, this insect typically prefers ash, but it will also infest other members of the olive or oleaceae family, such as uh, cultivated olive, fringe tree, but it really does prefer ash. So we're placing the, per, uh, the majority of our efforts on ash trees. This is a little bit about that life cycle that I covered. Now, it's typically a one-year life cycle. It can be two years in colder areas, but we um, estimate that it's going to be one year pretty much throughout Oregon. We do not know the exact timing of when the adults will emerge, for example, when they start laying eggs, et cetera. We only have a little bit of a template to go on from other places, but obviously that could be a little bit different um, where it's located here in Oregon at our latitude um, and at different elevations even. So we are monitoring that, but adults should be showing up sometime around June. Now they spend a very, as adults, they spend a very small period of time outside of the tree. So oftentimes you're gonna see the damage and not the insect itself. Um, but I do wanna review what it looks like, but more importantly, what it does not look like because we get a lot of false reports to follow up on and we don't want people killing a bunch of insects that are not emerald ash borer. So this insect is um, smaller than the size of a penny, probably about half inch in length. There's a bit of variation there. It's very slender. Um, it's all green. There's no lines or sculpturing or spots or hairs or anything on the back. It's very smooth and green. So to compare it to an insect that's quite often found in our landscape, the golden bee crested, which you see there listed as not EAB, that is a very common native widespread wood boring beetle um, that is often found and misidentified as emerald ash borer because people just see something metallic and green. But as you can see here, it's more robust, but more importantly, it's got some other colors on it. That's very distinct. It's not all over green. It's got some ridges. So there's some differences there. And ODA put together a really nice lookalike key um, that you can find online. And I have a link to later in this presentation, which um, I will share with Becky so that you have access to it. Now, most importantly, looking for the signs and symptoms outside of the insect, because you're often not going to see the adult, and then you're not going to dig underneath the bark and look for the larva. Um, that's usually later when you confirm that I'm seeing all the other signs and symptoms. Let's really try and detect if there's an insect here. Um, the first thing you want to look for is, is it an ash tree? If it's not, likely not emerald ash borer. So is it an ash tree? And then what are the symptoms? What, what kind of damage are you seeing? So top kill, thinning, and thinning often starts at the very top of the tree, but it can be throughout the crown. And then epicormic shoots um, or bark splits as the larva works its way underneath the bark, it'll separate the bark from the wood and splits can form or the bark can get a little loosened. And remember that I mentioned that as it turns into a pupa, it moves into the outer bark. And so uh, woodpeckers can actually hear this insect moving around and they will go and shave off the outer layers of the bark to pick out those larvae. So seeing some lighter colored bark from that woodpecker shaving um, is very distinctive. 
And then those V-shaped exit holes. Now there are many other insects that get into ash trees. There are other wood borers that get into ash trees. But if you see V-shaped, um, um, some of them look a little bit more oval or round, but they do look cleanly carved out, so it's not a messy hole. Um, but look for the majority of them being more V-shaped, and that's going to be um, pretty indicative of emerald ash borer. If you see an ash that has these stress symptoms, has a thinning crown or top tail, recognize drought causes that too, take a closer look. If you see anything that looks like V-shaped exit holes, we want to know about it. And I have a link later on about how to report that. Okay, so as I mentioned, all the agencies are pulling together. This is Oregon State University, Oregon Department of Forestry. The Oregon Department of Agriculture is actually the lead agency um, because they actually have enforcement ability for quarantines and um, pesticides, et cetera. Um, APHIS and then U.S. Forest Service. Now, this is, these are just kind of the top ones that manage a lot of these pieces, but we are working with many other folks, um, a lot of smaller municipalities, um, SWCDs, such as yourselves, um, and then uh, cities, um, uh, park municipalities, um, they're all pulling together, utilities even. We have a lot of folks um, that attend all of these meetings that are doing planning, that are doing monitoring. Um, we couldn't do it with all, without all of these other partners and cooperators. So this is a little bit of what we did preparing for Emerald Ash Borer, assuming that it would get here. So in 2013 and 2016, we had statewide EAB survey, surveys where we hung those big purple prism traps you may have seen there in the bottom right picture. We hung over a thousand traps um, throughout the areas that we have identified ash. Um, and as I mentioned, emerald ash borer doesn't come readily to these traps, even if they're baited with lures, which ours were. Um, it really oftentimes will, um, it can smell those lures and it'll come to the area, but then it'll go to the ash tree because they're more uh, volatiles that are coming off the ash that are really attractive. And there's the, the touch and the, the sight of an ash tree that varies from these traps. And so it may bring more beetles to the yard, but they're really going to go after the ash tree. So these traps aren't super effective, but they can be a good monitoring tool, especially if you hang them from a girdled ash tree. So that ash tree is very stressed and it's releasing a lot of attract, um, attraction for those beetles so that a higher concentration come to the area. Um, we actually stopped doing the trapping because it was very expensive. Um, APHIS dropped the quarantine, and so we really didn't have funding to do it any longer. However, now we do have some more trap sensor protection, and we are hanging them in sparingly in some key places, especially around the initial detection area. We also started a, a training program, and this was led by Oregon State University called Oregon Forest Pest Detectors. Some of you may have heard of it or have taken it in which we've trained over 500 professionals. So it's folks like you that are working on the ground, that have your eyes open, looking at trees at all times, um, that we want you to know exactly what you should be looking for and who to report it to. And so that is a free training. It's online at all times. There's a link later in the presentation. We encourage you to take it, at least look it over. There are credits available too if you pay a small fee. Um, we also developed a response plan that was finalized in 2021 so we started it in 2019. It was built off of all the other response plans and management plans that other states had come up with. So we learned a lot from talking to other folks about what to do, what not to waste your time on, um, where to really put your resources, what do they wish they had done. Um, and so once we had this plan established, it's not as detailed as the plans we're coming up with now, because now we kind of know like what our resources are, what we need to protect, where this is starting to occur. But what it did tell us was, okay, once we find Emerald Ash Borer, who's the lead agency? What agency does what? And so when this occurred, we knew exactly who to call, what to do. Um, there, the protocol was laid out and we came together very quickly rather than scrambling at the last minute. And um, agencies already agreed uh, in what their role would be. So nobody could say, well, we don't have the staff or budget this year, sorry, we don't wanna be involved they are already looped in and have agreed to work on this. Um, what I think is probably one of the most important things that we did to prepare, um, Wyatt set up the 2019 to 2022 ash seed collection in which he collected ash seeds from throughout the range of ash so that we could get a wide genetic diversity of ash, organ ash on our landscape, protected, collected and put into cold storage for future outplantings, but also for resistance trials that hopefully we can find some resistance down the road and keep this tree on our landscape. 
Now that is really hopeful. Resistance often takes years and years. Sometimes it's never found, um, but it's definitely worth trying. Possibly we might see some resistance on our landscape in areas where we have heavy infestations down the road and some ash trees survive. So we have our eyes out for that as well. So what is our response now that we have found emerald ash borer? So um, first of all, there's a temporary quarantine in Washington County that is going to become permanent very soon. So no untreated ash can leave Washington County. This is going to be damaging for the many nurseries that are present there, especially ones supplying ash for re restoration efforts. Um, but um, we are working with them on trying to figure out ways to better serve um, those folks that are going to face a little bit of a financial loss. However, um, we are advising no more ash plantings, especially for restorations. And so the, um, once the current stocks are gone from those nurseries, um, there really won't be a need for them to continue growing ash. Um, we are monitoring um, for more infestations so far. We have only found um, infestations right around that immediate area in Forest Grove. So over 9,000 trees have been monitored thus far. Um, about 40 trees are suspected or confirmed infested. Another 300 or so are suspected infested that will keep monitoring them as the season continues to see if they actually are infested. This is something we can do year round and have been doing year round. Currently, it's mostly um, OSU, ODF, and ODA staff that are doing this monitoring, but we have a whole bunch of city partners and clean water services, CHPRD, other um, smaller municipalities that are also doing this monitoring. And if you want to set up a monitoring program in Marion County, we um, definitely encourage that, especially as this infestation spreads. Um, we do have a survey one, two, three that we can loop you in on. Um, and the results of that are in a dashboard that I have the link to at the end of this presentation that you can actually watch how this infestation is going to um, be determined to have spread. We're also establishing biocontrol agents, three wasps, uh, very tiny little wasps that are really effective at controlling emerald ash borer. Um, it is classic biocontrol, so they are from the origin of emerald ash borer. They've been extensively tested. Um, they, they are very, very helpful at reducing populations, but they will not eradicate a population. Um, lastly, for our response, we have a, a huge list of folks in our subcommittees, and all these different subcommittees are tackling the different pieces of this project, largely that are going to deal with the economic and ecological losses that we're about to face. And so um, we have a lot of hands on deck tackling um, you know, more intensive research. What do we do with the material once it's infested? Providing outreach, um, this biocontrol effort, um, and drumming up funding, which is gonna be very important down the road. So um, for management guidance, um, we do advise for prevention um, to take stock of what ash trees you have in your coverage areas monitor the health of those ash trees. If you start seeing something that doesn't look quite right in terms of their vigor, um, take a closer look for those signs and symptoms. Now realize healthy ash trees will die less quickly from emerald ash borer, but they will still be killed from emerald ash borer. So making your trees as healthy as possible to give them more time can be helpful, um, but do avoid in the future planting ash. Now this is difficult, especially for folks that are um, doing restoration in waterways that we don't have a lot of one-to-one -one replacements. In the next slide, I'll have some examples of what replacements we are suggesting. Um, you can do some preventative treatment using uh, systemic insecticides such as MMX and benzoate. That's uh, most effective, it lasts three years. Um, it does work really well, but obviously it's expensive and it's something that you would have to do for the long term. Um, so it really requires a lot of um, forward thinking decision making and judicious application of this product. Um, and then we are advising for firewood not to be moved more than 10 miles. So if you have any outlets to talk with your clients about moving firewood, um, I say don't move firewood at all, buy it where you burn it, but at least try to not move it within 10 miles and also being aware that if you're in the Washington County area, the ash cannot be moved at all. Um, for treatment, once you know that you have infested trees, we are advising the material to be chipped or masticated, just broken down into small pieces. It can be kiln dried but, um, for 60 minutes at 60 degrees C. However, that needs to be a core temperature 60 degrees C, not just that's what the kiln is set at. Um, so you really need to cook it thoroughly. Um, you can also incinerate the material. 
Um, it can be useful in um, biochar efforts, for example. We do have things like curtain burners that um, we will have at certain stations to have kind of burn day for infested material. This material can also be fumigated, but we do not suggest that. So here are some options for some native trees that can be planted depending upon the soil type or um, if it's a more wet or dry site. However, um, this isn't a lot of options and none of these is a good one-to-one -one replacement for Oregon ash. Um, there are non-native options that um, we may want to pursue. Obviously, we wanna be careful with that, um, but when you're faced with not having any tree canopy versus a non-native tree canopy, I think we know what options would be preferable. So in summary, we have only currently detected emerald ash from Washington County. Doesn't mean it's not elsewhere. We just have not found it there yet, but we do have a lot of people looking. Um, infestations can spread about 10 miles a year. So that perimeter will grow about 10 miles a year. There's a lot of variation there in terms of habitat connectivity, how close is the next ash, um, how infested is this current population. So there's some variation there. Um, we do advise that you avoid planting ash and then monitor ash for signs and symptoms of infestation and report them to our online hotline. Please, please include an image and location. We get so many reports and we need to know which ones we need to focus on first. And um, we all have limited staff to pursue this. So here are all the resources that I mentioned during the presentation. Um, I will provide this presentation so you have um, links to those. And I'll just uh, leave it open for questions. Great, thank you, Christine. There are a couple of questions that came up in our chat. So I'm gonna go ahead and go through those. I'll read the questions aloud. If any of you um, attending today have questions, go, go ahead and put them in the chat and we'll get to them before we end the Zoom call. So our first question, uh, what aid is there from the state to help local governments in developing plans for their local jurisdictions? Our city, Silverton, has large riparian corridor. I'm on city council and the chair of EMC. I'm a horticulture and arborist. Um, I'm well positioned to help our city, but don't want to reinvent um, or waste time. Yeah, so... Um... We actually have several different efforts right now to drum up more funds. Some of them are federal funds through um, folks like APHIS, um, but really we're um, trying to tackle it at the legislature level. And so right now, the thing that comes to the front of my mind that you should be aware of is there's a bill, and I cannot remember offhand what number it is, um, but it's basically for green infrastructure for urban areas. And so it's trying to provide those resources in terms of um, job, money, and plant materials to replace areas that have been affected by emerald ash borer. It's also covering some other things, but it's a huge chunk of change, and we um, feel very confident that that's going to pass. So Scott Altenhoff is our urban forestry person at ODF. Um, you may know him. I think that he was based out of um, Corvallis previous. Um, but he is heading that for ODF. And so you can talk with him about that and I can provide his information in the chat. Um, but we're also tackling, um, we as in all the agencies are tackling some other pots of money through legislature. We got a bunch of infrastructure, the BIL funding, um, the Build Back Better. Um, and so we are putting a lot of that towards Emerald Ash Borer and some of that is coming to communities and providing curtain burners or ways to destroy materials, um, not so much in replanting, um, but more so controlling infestations. And so that's something that you can connect with ODF. So myself or Wyatt um, or ODA, I believe they have money earmarked for that as well. And then lastly, um, the Oregon Invasive Species Council is very good at drumming up money from legislature and they are tackling a lot of efforts. So I would definitely connect with them as well um, if you have interest in participating in that. Um, but really kind of connecting with uh, Scott, I think is a really good start, especially since you're an SWCB and you're going to be working in a lot of urban areas. And I'll, um, I'll find his uh, email and put that in the chat. Great, thanks. Uh, next question, do Oregon White Oak and Pacific Madrone have similar drought slash wet tolerant capabilities? Um, Oregon white oak actually surprisingly does very well in moist areas. Um, we know it as an oak savanna tree, but it does really well in moist areas. Um, Madrone is really variable. Some areas um, it, it 
I think there's a bit of a genotype difference. So we do see madrone in wet sites up in Washington, but in Oregon, we see it mostly in drier sites. And so um, I think that's a genotype difference that we're seeing there. Um, I've seen some madrone do pretty well in some moist areas in Clackamas County, um, but that's been really rare. I would say that that's more of a dry site. And then oak is pretty flexible as to being wet or dry site, not waterlogged. So standing water, that's going to be a difficult one. Neither of those trees can withstand that. Ash is one of the few trees that can withstand that. Unfortunately, another tree that can withstand that is things like cottonwood, stuff that nobody really loves to plant. Um, but those are some of our only options. Thanks. Uh, next up, are there state funds slash resources to conduct citywide GIS tree surveys in order to better track uh, potential infestations of EAB? Yes, so that's that survey one, two, three that I mentioned. And so if you have an interest in getting involved in that, um, I think it would be great to have the whole of Marion County SWCD if you have the if you have AGOL accounts, so GIS accounts, or if there's, um, I think that they might have um, like a, a dummy sign in that anybody can use to um, put it, put in a report. We definitely want more eyes on the ground, especially outside of the Washington County area. So I will put a contact for that as well in the chat. Um, that's going to be uh, Matt Rog or uh, Max Ragazzino. So um, just making notes here so I don't forget, but I'll put both of those in the chat. 